Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. Well, one dude and one very sick dude. <laughs> That's me. The <laughs> sick dude. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I'm one sick puppy. No. I've got I've got the sexy phlegm. <laughs> you have to tell us the story of how you got it. I will. But first of all, I'm going to tell you that I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. And when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds. So I've completely turned my health around. In this show is a document of our experiences thriving for years in ketosis. And reversing diabetes, as long as our voices last. (laughs) (laughs) And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Not on your life, sir. (laughs) We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind that. And we share studies that we found in the show notes. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Yes, sir. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot, will not, shall not, and therefore will not, as I said, be ignored. (laughs) (laughs) So let's start podcast number 122, Sarah Hallberg Reverses Diabetes. So Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Yeah, that was uh, number 121, Kirsty Wood, low-carb exercise physiologist. Actually, we misspelled her last name. Her last name is Woods, Uh, not Wood. I'm so sorry, (laughs) Kirsty. Yep. It happens. Very sorry about that, Kirsty. But it was a great interview, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is, Richard. Ketogenic diet is any diet that puts you in a state of nutritional ketosis, which is where your body is burning fat, either body fat or plate fat, for fuel. And to get there, you need to eat 20 grams or less of carbohydrates every day. And mm-hmm. yeah, and you need to have moderate amount of protein, which is one to one and a half grams of protein for every kilogram of lean body mass you have. At least that's how we did it. That's how we did it. Yep. And all of your energy comes from fat. Like yeah, I see, said. we get our energy from primarily three sources, carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And protein's like the backup for when you don't have any carbohydrate and fat. You, sh- you shouldn't be getting energy from that. Most people get their energy from carbohydrates, and they're locked into that all their lives. And uh, what we've discovered is that if we can get our energy from fat, we don't need any carbohydrate, uh, we become more healthy. And that's yeah. how it's worked for us. And without going into it a lot, you can't really use both at the same time. You have no. to either use carbohydrates or glucose. Don't eat donuts, people. Don't eat donuts. Right. <laughs> Sugar and fat at the same time is a bad recipe. You really can't yeah. utilize yeah. both of them at the same time. Yeah. So, I have no problem with somebody eating only sugar as long as they have no fat at all. Right. But that's still almost impossible. So, almost impossible. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Richard, how was your week? Uh, I hear that you're, from the tone of your voice, that it was quite interesting. I has I has the pestilence. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I probably got it from Gary Taubes or Sarah Halberg. <laughs> no, all three no. Of us were you sick said you were dogs. sitting between two guys that were sick on the plane, I right? Was, I was sitting between two Russians from Dubai to Zurich, and they were coughing the whole time. So I, there's a good chance I picked it up from them, but it didn't really manifest until about two days into the journey, by which stage Gary uh, Taubes was already sick. So, hmm. you know, who knows? Who knows where these things come from? But uh, the, the end result is... He may have not been on that same plane because he was coming from California, right? Yeah. That, oh, yes. That's right. And yeah. I, I think Sarah was coming from Idaho or something. Anyway. So, maybe you got um, them both sick from those guys on the plane. <laughs> I, I, I hate to think that because they both got me healthy. <laughs> yeah, right. Someday there'll be an app that'll track all that, right? <laughs> yeah. w- work out who's patient one. Yeah. <laughs> so, my past week was be- very interesting, in fact, yeah. now that you ask. So, I've been all over the world. And, and interestingly enough, 
I never had a foreign currency in my pocket. I Everything was on credit cards. Wow. Everything was on, like Uber was on my phone. So I literally went for through three countries in the past month without ever having to change currency. That's so, so cool. that's an interesting thing. That is cool. <laughs> this trip was actually to Zurich to a conference called Food for Thought, which is run by the British Medical Journal and Swiss Re, a large insurance company. And it was all a traditional um, – uh, food um, and nutrition experts, Walter Willett from Harvard, Darius Musafarin from Tufts, uh, Salim Yusuf from McMaster's, uh, um, Jenny Brand Miller from University of Sydney. These are these are the um, the experts in high carb, <laughs> low fat nutrition, uh, and they presented a lot of their papers. And then at the end of each paper, there was a panel, and this is common for nutrition conferences, but normally there's no low-carb people on the panel. Yeah. But in this case, we had a person on every panel. And so when somebody like Jenny Brand Miller says something like, well, you know, ketogenic diets are, are, are only reasonable for men to be on for a short term. Nobody can stay on for very long. Mm. Sarah Halberg, who was on the panel, was able to say, you know, actually, we've had 260 people on a ketogenic diet and we've got an 83% compliance. That's amazing, right? actually. Yeah, it 83%. is. 83%. I mean, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, if there's a chocolate factory in Australia that allows their employees on the line to eat as much chocolate as they want, <laughs> and within a couple of weeks, people just stop eating chocolate. <laughs> so, you That's know, right. you it, get the same it, yeah. effect if, you, if you're a cook, like at a fast food restaurant. Yeah. Like the so, last so thing even, you want to eat is fast food, especially from right, that so, restaurant. So, even the eat as much chocolate as you want diet doesn't have 83% compliance. <laughs> so, you know, she was able to show, um, and th and she she knows they're compliant because she measures their ketones. Yeah. And so, you know, this is, we're going to talk to with Sarah later on in the interview, but um, that it was fascinating. So this conference was really an eye-opener because they came up with several statements. Uh, in fact, one of them I, I might have provoked a bit, but um, so – after the panels, they have a Q and A, and every Q and every panel uh, Q and A session, I've got my hand up like Miss, 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 ask me a question, Miss, <laughs> Miss, Miss, and, oh, and, oh, 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 Mr. Carter, <laughs> Mr. Carter, <laughs> and, and the and the lady on the side of the microphone keeps skipping past me because uh, you know there's all these famous Troublemaker. nutritionists in yeah. there. Yeah, there's a troublemaker in a black t-shirt over there. There's all these nutritionists in suits. We get get the microphone to them anyway. At the end of the conference, we had. Um, we had Darius Mosafarian come up and give an eloquent and uh, quite a well-respected um, defense of epidemiology. And he was basically saying, look, the only way we can know anything with any uh, reasonable amount of cost is through epidemiology. And he made a good case. And he was basically saying, you know, we can actually show a direct link between a nutrient, like saturated fat, mm. and a biomarker like LDL cholesterol. Mm. And we can show that people who have heart attacks, cardiovascular disease, are more likely to have a higher LDL. Mm. And so, therefore, you should be able to draw a straight line between the saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. Right. And then- Salim Yusuf got up and he s explained how you can't draw straight lines between these things. Right. So he was showing with salt. He said, you know, uh, we looked at salt intake and normally you'd say salt intake increases blood pressure. Yep. Increased blood pressure is correlated with cardiovascular disease. Right. So you can Therefore, say eat eating more salt means more cardiovascular disease. Right. And he tested salt versus cardiovascular disease. So ignoring blood pressure entirely. Right. And he was he was able to find that um, that there that there is a, a U-shaped relationship, but it, 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 it heads off very gently as you increase and increase more salt. So yeah. the actual cardiovascular disease doesn't doesn't everyone expects it's, you know, doubling and tripling. No, it's right. it's a really slight, modest increase. Even right. when you eat a lot of salt. It's like when firefighters all converge on a home, there's a higher yeah. chance that that home will be on fire. Therefore, yeah, right. firefighters cause fires. Yeah, right. I mean, that's the thing. And so I, I, I made the comment. Everyone was missing this. That Salim Yusuf's pure study discovered a couple of things. It discovered this salt thing that you know we can all eat a little bit more salt. Mm -hmm. It also discovered that that um, uh, there was a there was a, a correlation between uh, increased carbohydrate and cardiovascular disease. Right. 
And he also discovered, this is interesting, there was no correlation between saturated fat in the diet and cardiovascular disease, and there was a positive correlation between saturated fat in the diet and stroke risk. So, Mm. in fact, the more, and it was dose-dependent. A lack of stroke risk. In other words, the more saturated fat, the lower your stroke risk. That's right, yes. Yeah. So, so, but the, but the important thing, I, 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 this is the question I ask. I said, look, um, uh, Nina Teicholz yesterday said that the one piece of science that she really respects out of epidemiology is when it finds nothing. When right. it finds no correlation, no correlation, you can probably have used to that to infer that there is no causation yes. in- involved. But if you find a correlation... Unless it's really large enough, you really can't infer causation. So I, um, I said, well, you know, I'd like to invite the panel, Darius Musafarian from Tufts and Salim Yusuf from McMaster's. Now, listen up, people. Listen up to the, This is really <laughs> historic, what Richard's yeah. about to say here. This is well, such yeah. a big take home. Uh, okay, now go ahead, Richard. Now everybody's primed and ready. So I said, <laughs> I'd like to invite the panel to discuss uh, the findings from the Pure Study in the area of the coral of the lack of ob- observed association between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease, mm. and Darius Mosafarian, this is the guy who is like the heir apparent of Walter Willett. If you don't know who these guys are, these guys, as you said before, are all low fat, high carb. Yeah, you know, eat less, exercise more kind of proponents. Plant based. Yeah, plant based, whole grain foods. Mm. These are the guys who've been driving this n- nutritional research. Um, out of a, cu- a couple of massive epidemiological studies uh, for many years. They've been yeah, just yeah. going back into the same data and retorturing it. Right. So, so anyway, he said from the stage there have been 14 studies that I know of to test a causation between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease and not a single one has successfully shown it. Mm. And, and, you know, Walter Willett's sitting in the second row and he didn't spontaneously combust. Right. So, <laughs> you know, and at the end of the conference, Fiona Goodley, who is the, the, the chief editor of the British Medical Journal, said, I think we can take um, a couple of uh, uh, takeaways from this conference, things that we all agree on, and one of those is that saturated fat is not a nutrient of concern. Okay. Boing. This is wow. such a momentous <laughs> point in history. That I want everybody to reflect on this just for a minute here. You know, anybody who tells you, you know, you're going to kill yourself by eating all that fat, the experts, the vegan experts, the vegetarian experts, the low fat experts, the exercise experts, the low carb experts, everybody agrees that the science cannot prove a link between saturated fat consumption and heart disease. Except the dietitians, and this is a myth that saturated fat causes heart disease. It is a myth that is unkillable by science. It cannot be killed with evidence because 14 studies have gone in to show this and it just cannot be killed. Are you talking about among the dietitians? Among the dietitians, among the the so-called food practitioners in our uh, healthcare practitioners, the food specialists, um, they just, it just cannot be killed. Hmm. So, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you show it with evidence. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Pure study was, what, 18 countries, about a third of a million individuals, and showed no correlation. It's still not adequate evidence. It, it, but when you get the experts that represent these people in a room and they all agree, yeah, there's something compelling about that. It is, yeah. yeah. Well, at least we've got at least we've got that. We've drawn a line under that. The other thing that happened out of this conference that was fascinating is that we all agree now that diabetes is reversible. That's great. Which wasn't the case before the conference. Yeah. So those are the two takeaways for me: is saturated fat is not an issue of concern, and we saw Darius Mustafarian uh, uh, tell us that essentially from the mm. stage, and um, and also um, that. Uh, diabetes is reversible. Type and the two, lady we're yeah. going to interview today is going to, she's the one who has shown not only that um, it's reversible, uh, but that she can reverse it in a lot of people in a very large study over a long period of time mm. and made the case from the stage during her panel session that diabetes is reversible three ways. You know, we, hmm. we, we tend to think of di- all of the diabetes associations tell you it's a progressive disease. Right. It only gets worse. Right. But there's three ways to reverse it. A, um, 
a gastric sleeve operation will will reverse your diabetes right. before any weight loss has happened. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. pretty much the first week, yeah. even before any weight loss has happened, diabetes is reversed. <laughs> the second way of doing it is through caloric restriction, and that's Roy Taylor's work in Newcastle. Mm. And he's able to show with an 800-calorie diet for eight weeks, he's able to get enough of the ectopic fat in the pancreas to go that the pancreas starts behaving normally, and so your high-end glucose stasis control um, is functioning again. Mm -hmm. And then Sarah Halberg and Professor Finney were able to show in the Verta study how they can, by removing all sugar and starch out of the diet, you can get your low-range glucose stasis taking over the job, and instead of your pancreas being responsible for keeping glucose in control, it's your liver, and Mm. that also reverses diabetes. So Mm. there you go. There you so go. That, that was, that was Take my your week. pick. Take your pick. And so, so how is your week, Carl? Oh, my God. It doesn't compare to yours. That's astounding. I mean, that's momentous. I think when you tell that story, I'm thinking this is a historic moment, right? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, my, my week was great. Um, uh, I'm, you know, spending a lot of time writing software and preparing for Keto Fest, of course, which is shaping up mm. nicely. Excellent. And uh, I just finished. This is we're recording this Saturday night, you know, and mm-hmm. on the on the uh, the twenty third, and so I just finished the third keto mini fest ever. Nice. And mm-hmm. this time I did it at my house, and the theme was Ketoki fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a KFC experience. Yeah, and you know, I don't want to actually call out the company by name for you know. Oh, I, my I, apologies. <laughs> that's quite all right. I mean, everybody knows what we're talking about. It's fine, but the thing is that that was a real big childhood memory for me, food wise, and so I wanted to recreate the experience. And pretty much yeah. everything was dead on successful, except for the collie mash, and I'll tell you why. But it was a. Uh, you know, fried chicken with the right yep. recipe and the right way to cook it. And that was the recipe you gave us last week, right? Yep. It was mm-hmm. coleslaw mm. and it was uh, collie mash and gravy and mm-hmm. it was uh, the chocolate parfait. Now, I know for a fact that KFC does not sell the chocolate parfait anymore. Really? Because I went through the drive through and I tried to get one. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. But the chocolate parfait used to be a little graham cracker crumble at the bottom, some chocolate pudding, some whipped cream, probably Cool Whip, and some chocolate sprinkles Mm -hmm. on top. So um, basically what I did was I took crushed macadamia nuts and put those at the bottom. Nice. You know, salted roasted nuts. better than graham crackers. Of course. Of course. It's like real flavor, right? Yeah. And for the chocolate pudding, I made a chocolate anglaise. Mm-hmm. So I made a creme anglaise and I added Hershey's chocolate to it and a little bit of Hershey's oh. special dark chocolate as well mm-hmm. and let that sit overnight and that was great. And then I made, just made whipped cream for the top. But the coleslaw was the killer. Uh, and I had made a coleslaw before and I did a keto coleslaw recipe. But this right. time I was like, no, I want to go for K- the the actual taste of KFC coleslaw. Okay. And that is my recipe for today. Excellent. I look yeah. forward to that. But it was a great success. Everybody loved it. There's going to be pictures on uh, on that. And and I do this through a local meetup, by the way, which I started at meetup.2keto.com. It's the New London County Ketogenic Meetup Group. And uh, since I started, we've got almost 350 members. Wow. And um, I had about 20 people come tonight from all around. One guy came from New Jersey. Wow. That's not Raj again, is it? No. This guy yeah. drove about four hours. His name is Charles. He drove about four uh, hours just to come wow. to dinner and hang uh, out. And Amber was our guest, Amber O'Hearn. Mm, nice. Mm-hmm. The so, carnivore? The carnivore, yeah. So it was great. Um, we had a, a very, very good time. Mm. So, Richard, let's give away some swag. Yeah, let's do that. So every show we pick a lucky winner at random from the members of the Two Keto Dudes fan club. Yes, and today we're giving away a treasure trove of stuff from vendors we like, all of which you can find at fanclub.2keto.com. So who's our winner for this week? Today's winner is Alicia Gardner. Congratulations, Alicia. So let's tell everybody what she has won. Well, the first thing we're giving away is a Two Keto Dudes coffee mug that says, Keep Calm and Keto On. 
Nice. And a signed copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me by Dr. Ken Berry? Yes, and I have it on good confidence that that audiobook, read by me, will be available by <laughs> KetoFest. Excellent. We're also giving away a packet of Peak Tea, that's P-I-Q-U-E, Tea, recommended mm. by Dr. Jason Fung and others to support fasting. It's a dehydrated instant green tea with many flavors. Just add water and you've got an amazing tea, iced or hot, that will help you with your fasting efforts. And a cheese-making kit from Pamela Zorn, who's going to be teaching cheese-making classes at Keto Fest. And if you don't want to wait to win some swag, you can buy all sorts of it online at gear.2keto.com. Absolutely. And that brings us to... Mail! I cannot get in the last word. I think I just did, actually. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> um, Give me one more mail. Mail. There you go. <laughs> so, Carl, what mail do you have for us today? Well, this one is from the forum, and it's from the newbies, tips from the oldies uh, category. Ooh. This is from Moo Boom, who says, doing keto solely to lose weight? Read this. I was a starry-eyed newbie with huge expectations once. I get it. You're excited. Great swaths of weight are about to fall off you with relative ease. You'll be buying new clothes every month. You're shrinking so fast. Friends and family will be in awe of your dramatic rapid weight loss. Only none of that is likely to be true. Sorry, <laughs> pumpkins. Keto mm -hmm. is not a magic bullet. Keto is not a diet. Keto is a way of eating which enables your body to undo years of metabolic damage, abuse from calorie-restricted diets, and metabolic dysregulation. Keto is primarily about health and healing. Yes, it's true that the weight will come off, but it will do it when it wants to. For some people, it happens fast, but I'm sorry to say they are unicorns. Yeah. For most of us, it's a slow process with stalls and gains as well as losses. It's a journey, a journey which requires research, experimentation, trial and error, and overcoming your fear of fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll probably lose an exciting amount of weight during your first week or two of keto. That is your body depleting its glycogen stores. Next up, you'll most likely stall, awesomely named PISS, P-I-S-S, -S, which is Post-induction stage stall. Yep. That's from Atkins era, yep, right? That's right. Yep. You may very well not see any loss on the scales, and you're going to want to freak out because you think you're doing it wrong or keto doesn't work. Wrong! Going keto is a big deal for your body. It's likely going to freak out a bit. After all, you've taken yeah, away bit. its glucose, and it's wondering where the energy is going to come from. If you're mm. suffering from the keto flu, type the word electrolytes into the search bar. Research it yeah. and follow it. You'll be glad you did. Um, yeah. That's a little plug for the ketogenic forum search bar. Yeah. Then it's going to start healing, rebuilding muscle, strengthening bone, bolstering your immune system, making mm -hmm. you healthier. It's doing all that while your scales aren't budging. So please do yourselves a favor and throw away the damn scales. They are no yeah. longer your friend and never really were anyway. Get a measuring tape. Take your measurements. Watch your clothes fit better. Take progress photos. Who cares what you weigh if you fit into smaller clothes and look similar and healthier? Weight right. loss is not linear. Keto is about health. Weight loss is hormonal. Keep calm mm. and keto on. You're going to well hear those statements. Yeah. You're going to hear those statements a lot for good reason. They'll probably be uttered with a little weariness if you're less than a month into keto and complaining that you haven't lost 50 billion pounds too. Read as much as you can in this forum. Educate yourselves because there is a lot of info here just waiting for you to find it. It's a super exciting journey, which you'll be so glad you started a year from now. Give it a chance, but do your homework and reset your expectations. We will be here to cheer you on. Nice. You know, I had this conversation tonight with a bunch of people um, mm. who are always getting into conversations with people that they feel embarrassed because 
it seems like the ketogenic diet is a magic bullet and that's a good right that's a real let's ta- let's unpack that word magic bullet or that mm-hmm. phrase for mm-hmm. a minute we are so used to technologies and pills drugs whatever um you know working against the body outsmarting the body to fix things right to sure. fix problems yep, yep. Mm-hmm. that's the way we think we have to outsmart it's everything this- it's the assumption that our body doesn't know how to run itself. Exactly. And the fact of the matter is, the truth is, the body knows how and can and will heal itself without your help. All you have to do is take away the stuff that's preventing it from doing so. Mm. That's yeah, what keto that's right. is. Yeah. You're removing the so, barriers for your body to heal itself, and all of these wonderful benefits happen, but it's not, you know, it's not the eggs or the cheese <laughs> or, you know, yeah. or the butter. Or the fat, or even all the fat. All the fat. Yeah, it's, it's not. None of that. It's not that. It's, it's, it's just not eating carbs takes away the derangement that has been spinning you out of control. Exactly. And once you're, once you're in control- you're, once your body is able to reach its safe homeostasis, that's what the body does. We've evolved over millions of years. Right. Uh, humans have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years just to um, get to this point. And, we eat fat because um, we it, can get calories from it without deranging our metabolism. That's why that's we eat right. it. It's not that's, that it's a it. magic bullet that's going to fix everything. Your body no, fixes no. things. The fat doesn't yeah. do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's. I was really excited when I read that and I just wanted to share it. So. That's so I actually have an interesting uh, experience from uh, from the conference I was at. I'm going to name drop a few names, so <laughs> I do apologize. You know, I was talking to the Pope the other day, <laughs> yeah, 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 and the Pope <laughs> said, "I take my advice. Don't ever name drop." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was talking to Mark Hyman, Doctor Mark Hyman, the sure, other day, sure. and, and he was at this conference, and he's a well known um, functional med- medical. Um, doctor, and he's uh, the director of the Cleveland Clinic and all of these things. And I had just given this um, Q&A response where I, I – and I started saying, look, I, I, I'll, I have to admit my own personal biases. My own personal biases, I was a type 2 diabetic. I reversed my disease on a low-carb ketogenic diet. And then I asked my question. Right. So he tweaked to this, and he, he wanted to, to see, you know, have you really reversed your diabetes, you know, and um, how much weight have you lost, and why why aren't you losing any more weight? Why hasn't it stopped? Why, do you, why are you still overweight? And, mm. and I said to him, look, you know, um, the goal for me was never weight. The goal for me always was health, right. and, uh, and that my body has found its homeostasis. This is the point – the place that my body has settled when I got all the derangements out of the way, um, and right. uh, I'm quite personally quite satisfied with, with where it's at. Uh, he said, "But yeah, you, you're going to lose some more weight, though." And I said, "Well, I can guarantee to lose weight by caloric restriction, but if I do that, I'm just going to balloon back up again. And in the process of going down, mm. I'm not going to be burning only fat. I'm going to be burning anything I can get energy out of, which includes lean tissue. So I'll, when I balloon back up again, I'll be in a poorer state." And he said, oh, I've got to talk to Eric Westman about this because he disagrees with you. <laughs> so we went over to talk to Eric Westman, and um, and and Eric Westman is a, is a bariatric specialist, is a specialist in, in helping people lose weight. Right. He's very good at it. His opinion is you need a mild caloric restriction to be able to to lose weight below being overweight. Right. And um, – and then I was, and then just by coincidence, Stephen Finney walks into the room, and Stephen Finney is like, "Well, no, you know the homeostasis that your body will settle on." He was talking about the Finney weight, and by the way, he said he doesn't like his name associated with that. But this is the weight that you f- that your body is able to be most comfortable at uh, when you re- remove all the derangements. Right. And and he said, you know, the new homeostasis that's a wonderful thing if you can get somebody to lose a hundred pounds, pointing to me, and then. And keep it off for four years. You've already done the impossible. Right. You know that that's just that's just not not achievable in mm. modern medicine. He said that's a plus. I would I would grade that as a plus. <laughs> and he said, you know, the um, if you want to, you know, if you want to really get a, a high distinction, then over time, yeah, your body may may lose some more weight. Uh, we see that happen in a lot of people. But the important thing is that you've 
maintain control of your glucostasis. Mm. And, uh, so anyway, that, that that's like that's the the technical part uh, uh, conversation to this uh, to this mail. It's just so very cool. I'm going to use that comment by Professor Finney as my mail for today. Oh, all right, awesome. So there you go. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, well, let's bring on the uh, the interview that you did with Sarah Hallberg. Um, we met her mm. at Low Carb Breckenridge, and of course, I saw her TED talk, and I was I, I was just yeah. in awe. It was great. Uh, she may have done more, but I saw the at least the first one that she did. And I was very impressed. Yeah. And, of course, now she works for Verda. As you said, she did this great study. So let's just roll that conversation, and we'll talk about it on the other side. Sure. Okay, I'm here in Zurich with Sarah Halberg, and we both have horrible colds. That's right. <laughs> so I apologize for the quality of our, our voices, but uh, we'll do our best. So we're here at this conference where we've been talking about uh, low-carb. But first of all, the conference was a, a traditional nutrition conference with a lot of people like Walter Willett and uh, Jenny Brand Miller and Sarah was actually on one of the panels and she presented some of her Verta uh, study so tell us about Verta. Well yeah so uh, I am very excited to be part of Verta so our um, company's mission I'll start with that mm. is to reverse uh, 100 million cases of type 2 diabetes by the year 2025. Wow. <laughs> Which I, yeah, sounds like a pipe dream initially, mm. but I think that based on um, the results of our large clinical trial, which is what I discussed here, um, that dream actually may be a reality. Wow. Um, so we, again, just published the one-year results of our large clinical trial. We'll be having the two-year results published um, hopefully sometime in the fall yeah. as we get a chance to write those up. Mm -hmm. But Verda is a two-pronged company. Okay. So in other words, we are a nutrition science company mm -hmm. because in order to help people reverse their type 2 diabetes, you have to get nutrition right. Yeah. But the second part is really critical. We are also a technology company. Mm. And the technology and our remote uh, continuous care platform allows us to support patients um, through lifestyle changes that are um, geared to induce nutritional ketosis right. as a means of reversing and sustaining a reversal of their type 2 diabetes. So this is an app that runs on a smartphone that allows you to be in contact with the patients from the coaches. And I assume the patients type in their glucose or uh, ketone numbers? That's right. So the Verda uh, treatment consists of five support modules, which are all enabled through the remote care. And okay. so number one is the one that you're discussing, which is biomarker tracking. Mm, so yeah. every patient who begins the Verda treatment gets a cell phone enabled scale. So they step up on it in the morning and it populates straight nice. into their, yeah. Yeah, their personal um, app mm -hmm. uh, portal. And in addition to that, they input their ketones, as you talked about. We check beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, serum Excellent. Uh, and blood glucose. And for those who need to, we also check blood pressure. Okay. So those biomarkers, obviously the patient can track those over time, but also critically important is those biomarkers go directly to the patient's individual health coach mm. and individual physician. Wow. So the biomarkers allow the health coach to really personalize the nutrition intervention for each particular patient. Um, so they use those to make the biomarkers to make suggestions and discussions about meals and meal planning. Yeah. The physician uses that data to make safe uh, medication reductions because the goal is of to course, get people yeah. off of medications, but people who are on a lot of medications to lower their blood sugars, especially insulin and sulfonylureas, if not managed appropriately, could be at risk for hypoglycemic events. Sure, yeah. So that physician supervision winds up becoming critical. Yeah. And As you titrate the, the amount of insulin down. And absolutely. Until we're off, right? Yeah, and then, right. yay. <laughs> <laughs> then there's less to be concerned about. Of course, we still need to monitor them. But especially in those first few weeks while we're um, decreasing medications, it's critical. Yeah. And then and in addition to that, patients are also supported through a resource center where they can get everything from short educational videos on, you know, everything from what is beta hydroxybutyrate to what about my cholesterol. Nice. Um, and recipes galore. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then the last thing is they're also um, allowed in on a. Um, 
uh, optional, but most patients do take us up on it, um, community support group of their peers right. online. Yeah, we find that's very important for people. I mean, we, we have a large community of people uh, as well who listen to the podcast, and and, they, and for them, the, these support groups where they can talk to other people who are going through the same the same process is really important. It so is. That's wonderful. It is. Yeah. The community support is critical. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I hope that through some of these um, online support groups, um, mm. you know, as we kind of spread the idea of low carbohydrate, high fat diets um, as a treatment uh, for type two diabetes reversal, actually, yeah. what we see is that we eventually get to kind of worldwide critical mass. Because <laughs> right. I'll tell you that we're, we really have hit critical mass in my hometown. Really? of Lafayette and West Lafayette, Indiana, where everybody is doing low carb. Yes. And so the support groups are happening happening organically, right? Yeah. Because it used to be really difficult when someone was um, trying to follow a low carb, high fat uh, diet to go in and, and a work party, right? Yeah, it was sure. used to be very difficult, right? Yeah. Every, what does everybody bring into the work parties, right? They got donuts and cakes galore. Sure. And now, because so many people are doing it, even if there is an office mate maybe who's not, they all understand that the rest of the people are. <laughs> and so, you know, they help support each other by not sabotaging each other Excellent. at some of these work-related yeah. things. Yeah. So I, I think it's pretty exciting um, and hope that we can spread that to, um, you know, other parts of the United States and, of course, around sure. the globe. So uh, I find it uh, fascinating, this idea of compliance. I mean, how... how uh, how many people are actually sticking to the program? So that's a really important question to have answered, isn't it? Because it's um, one of the criticisms people try to make with a low-carb, high-fat diet aimed to induce nutritional ketosis. And the fact of the matter is people make that concern all the time based on no evidence. Right. And so our trial can just cement the evidence to the opposite end because at the end of a year, we had 83% of our wow. uh, research participants still actively participating um, in the research program. Yeah. Uh, and so 83%, you know, one of the questions that we have to ask is who takes medications right. for a year at 83%? I mean, even that doesn't happen. No. So to be able to have nutrition compliance of 83% at a year is it's really remarkable. It reminds me of the chocolate factory in Australia and Cadbury Chocolate Factory in Tasmania. They let the, the people working on the line eat as much chocolate as they want. And within about a month, nobody's eating any chocolate. So even the eat as much chocolate as you want diet doesn't have that level of compliance. That's right. So, that's right. Oh, my goodness. That is funny. <laughs> that's right. You get sick of it, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, so that's remarkable. So obviously the diet is varied. It's sustainable. It's ob this. These are some of the criticisms we heard from the, from the traditional people that – a ketogenic diet is not sustainable uh -huh. and it's very difficult to do and that nobody really wants to stay on it forever and the problem is as soon as you go off it, all of your numbers go 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 back to where they were. Um, you're obviously showing that this is obviously a, 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 or evidently a, a, a very popular diet. People are enjoying it. Right. And so, you know, I'll, I'll go back to say the one thing we do have a lot of evidence of uh, being non-sustainable is the low-fat diet, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. if there's evidence for anything, it's that that is not sustained. I mean, we know that. Um, so as far as the low-carbohydrate diet, I, you know, the fact of the matter is this can be changed to sure. suit anyone, right? It, uh, you know, different cultural backgrounds, different, you know, family uh, traditions. You know, you can modify what you're eating to fit into a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet um, in all phases of your life and situations. And so that's one of the things I think uh, that's key is that it's not a one-size-fits-all way of eating. We can restrict carbohydrates and increase fat, you know, personally personalized so that people do find it enjoyable and therefore sustainable. Yeah. So we have a large audience uh, of listeners who are, are ketogenic, and a lot of them um, have family members that are also diabetic. I mean, the people who, who listen to us, are, for the most part, maybe 50% of them are diabetic and have found a ketogenic diet has re reversed or at least halted this, the progression of their disease. Uh, but a lot of them have family members who they find it very difficult. Maybe they don't live with and they find it very difficult to get onto a ketogenic diet. How could somebody... Um, uh, get into a Verta program. Is that something that you're, is op you're open for or, is, or you're still on the clinical trials? Um, no. Uh, so the Verta program is open and now we have many commercial patients um, as well as our patients in the clinical trial. Great. Um, currently, it's
It's only available in the United States, but it is available in all 50 states. Okay. Um, we do have long-term goals to go global. Mm. Um, we're just not there yet. And right now, we do have a direct-to-consumer market, but we are mostly... Um, uh, working with contracts with large uh, self-insured companies and uh, yeah. some insurance companies as mm. well uh, to make this available uh, so that people don't have to pay for it, that it yeah. can get paid through their health plan at work. Right. So uh, do you have anything that is physician-based? I, I, I know that the physicians can have access to the patient and must have access to the patient data so they could modify the medication. Um, do you have a physician-centered uh, approach where physicians can come to you and say, I've got so many uh, diabetic patients that want to get on the Verda program? Or? Oh, a referral? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we get a lot of referrals uh, into the Verda program from physicians, correct. And then would you train those physicians or you would use your own physicians? We, we use our own physicians. That's right. So we consider ourselves a online a specialty clinic. Gotcha. And so, you know, anything surrounding uh, type 2 diabetes is something that we take care of. And let's just... I'll expand on that a little bit because people think, well, type 2 diabetes, okay, you're monitoring their blood sugar, you know, maybe their blood pressure, mm. but there's so much more involved, right? Because yeah. we're also monitoring the behavioral aspects of sure. this, right? Yeah. And things like, how's the patient sleeping? I mean, so when we're talking about type 2 diabetes, it yes, we think primarily of blood sugar and that would be correct, yeah. um, but there's more to it than that. And mm -hmm. so as far as the Verda treatment goes, we like to consider ourselves really an all-encompassing um, online specialty clinic. Uh, aimed at type 2 diabetes, but that includes many facets of health. Right. I know a lot of my, uh, our listeners probably first saw you on a TED talk that you once did about reversing diabetes, which which went viral. It, it was massive. So what was that experience like? You would have been one of the first physicians on TED saying, hey, it's possible to reverse this disease. Yeah. So it was fantastic um, opportunity for me. Um and it was really interesting because um, it it was two days after I met Steve Finney for the first time. So okay. isn't that, is that hilarious? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Steve Finney and I were both at an Obesity Medicine Association conference. And I actually had to leave the conference early because I was giving the TED Talk two days later. But right. I made, met Steve and we had kind of planned a uh, clinical trial. So it was a it was a pretty big three-day uh, window of my yeah, life, that was so a big, to speak. Yeah, yeah. big moment. <laughs> so yeah, it was. Um, but I, I was asked uh, through Purdue to come and speak, um, and they all were aware of my clinic um, in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Sure. Uh, and so that's how uh, I wound up getting the invitation, and I thought really long and hard about exactly what I was going to talk about. and. You know, the question of how much do you push the envelope, so to speak, in a yeah. talk like this. And really, ultimately, I decided I was pushing the envelope. Go for because, it. Because, <laughs> you know, you can't – it was such an important message yeah. to get across that you need this, – this disease is reversible. Mm. And you cannot get there by following the standard of care, right? right. And so – I was hoping to be able to put out um, a really sensible plan on easy to understand physiology behind why the plan actually made sense. Um, and I, I feel uh, pretty good that it did accomplish those goals. Um, you know, the feedback I've gotten on it has been um, really fantastic in that it was easy to understand for people. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. One of the things that I always credit you with on our podcast is that you were the first person who, who's, who ever said, as far as I'm aware, uh, if you're going to eat vegetables, put butter on it. Yeah. Put you know, some kind of fat on it. And it's so true, you know. I mean, uh -huh. vegetables without vegetables without fat are boring. They're boring. <laughs> it's so funny in the clinic to see patients who, you know, say, you know, I could never get my daughter, my son, my husband, my wife um, to eat Brussels sprouts, but Brussels sprouts and bacon are now their oh, favorite yeah. thing because, you know, right, we really ruined vegetables for so long, sure. right, by saying that you had to just steam them or boil them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we like to consider at Verda that vegetables are a vehicle for fat consumption, yes, right? Yeah. Never eat a vegetable without fat. So you have to cook it in butter or olive oil or cream, or you have to dip it in something if they're raw. But, <laughs> and then you will not only 
decrease the carbs, increasing the fat, helping with uh, that feeling of being full. Yeah. Um, but you'll also really enjoy the food you're eating. Too. Yeah, nice. At the beginning of every show, we have a, a mail submission that somebody has sent us. Then we have the interview. And at the end of the show, we always have recipes. And Carl and I always do a recipe. And we think that um, people being able to cook their own food is like the the, the secret sauce for, for going ketogenic. Because once you can do that, you have control over everything. So I, I noticed you have recipes. Is that part of the program is to teach people how to cook? Well, so I would say teach people how to cook differently maybe. So so here's what I mean by that. And that is like, for example, when everybody left the house for the first time, right? You know, uh, went off on your own, got your own apartment, went to college, whatever the case might be. Um, you probably knew how to cook. Right. Your mom or dad probably taught you how to cook. But once you moved out of the house, you had to come up and develop your own routine, right? You still had sure. to come up with your own schedule. Like, what do you do with a chicken breast that you've got, you know, sure. on a Tuesday night and you're hungry in 10 minutes? Like, you have to develop those. And so kind of the same thing when someone is changing lifestyle. I don't need to go and teach them how to cook. But we do have to help them develop a new repertoire, right? right? A new yeah. repertoire. Like, what is a good, you know, really fast Tuesday night meal, right? right. And, and uh you know, what is taco, taco Tuesdays can still happen, right? Sure. Just yeah. rethink it a little bit. Mm. Um, and so, you know, those recipes and giving people ideas and teaching them how to modify things um, is an important part. Yeah. So one of the interesting things that we find for uh, for the ketogenic diet, and we, we don't really do it for weight loss, we really do it for the diabetes, but weight loss is something that certainly comes along with the ride. And it's it's quite a nice side effect if you're going to have quite one. A nice side effect. Yeah, so we we generally find that after about five or six months, people tend to plateau and then they stay there for a couple of years before things start to slow down. Is that something that you see in in the participants in your program? And yes. Ha, and how do you counsel them about? their expectations for weight loss. Right. Well, the big thing is to try to build expectations early on. So, you know, we do see that. Um, we see if you look at our one-year trial data, what we see is that people lose up to about eight months and then they uh, then they flat. Right. Then they have a flat line, right? So they're not gaining, they're not losing anymore. They're really just staying sta stable. And, you know, that weight loss plateau is something – you know, that we're very interested in. How do you help people? How do you guide and counsel people yeah. um, uh, about that weight loss plateau? And most of it is setting up expectations initially. But because, you know, if you think about a plateau, they can understandably be super frustrating. I mean, if someone hits a plateau and I could say, hey, look, you know, you're on a plateau right now, but September 6th, it's going to be over, right? I mean, yeah. people could do that. They'd right. be like, oh, okay, yeah. September 6th, it's going to be good. over, <laughs> and I can live through there and not be frustrated. Yeah. But but of course, we can't do that, right? right. We, we don't know how long it's going to last. And in some people, um, a weight plateau can last for quite a while. Yeah. And so, you know, the other thing is, is, again, setting up expectations and goals. And the goals, again, primarily, I mean, our metabolic health, yeah. not weight loss. Yeah. And so we have to, you know, again, people need to be reminded, look at how far you've come. You know what I mean? No, you're not going to be a bikini model maybe, you know, uh, next week, but you're healthy now. You're doing these things that you weren't able to do before. And, yeah. you know, there are ways that we could speed up uh, and, and get out of a weight loss plateau, right? Like significant, you know, insisting on calorie reduction, things sure. like that. But, yeah. you know, then you get into this, really? Is that sustainable? Mm. You know, or let's just be happy of where we're at right now, okay? Yeah. We're going to ride the plateau. And as you kind of pointed out, most of the time they do start losing again, yeah. okay? It's just that we can't give them a, a defined a period of time that that happens. Yeah. I know when Stephen Finney came to um, Australia, he he made a comment that was videotaped and that everybody has, has since um, captured. And this was, he, he made the comment that the weight that you will settle upon, your homeostasis, your new homeostasis, once you get all the derangements out of the, out of the whole scenario, the new homeostasis will be the weight that you're most comfortable with maintaining and you know you, you don't ha you don't have to work out five times a week if you hate it if you work out five times a week and you love it that's great right but if you if you hate every moment then don't do it you know exactly and so, exactly and so we we coined this the finney weight and i actually had breakfast with dr finney this morning and he was very unhappy with me because he he doesn't like his name associated with oh. anything that could have a potential <laughs> downside so i'm gonna have to uh 
I have to rethink what we're going to call that. But really, I mean, it, 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 it is a setting expectation. As you say, you're not going to be a bikini model, but you may be able to outrun one. That's you know? <laughs> ding, ding. I love that. That's right. That's exactly correct. And, you know, and enjoy things that you didn't, right? And not have to worry about, oh, my gosh, I have to take my insulin before my meal, you know, things like that. So um, I think when we can get people to focus on those critically important health components and quality of life components, you know, most people can ride. A, a plateau. Yeah. One of the things that has come out of this conference this week is the agreement from pretty much everybody from all sides of the picture that diabetes is reversible and also that saturated fat is fine. It's not a causal effect. It's not a, a causal um, factor for heart disease, which is wonderful. Yeah, that's that was a pretty remarkable moment, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. So I think that, you know, we are making progress, right, mm, on yeah. Um, getting um, this way of treating disease to be accepted in the mainstream. I, I mean, I still think that we've got some hurdles to cross, but I think the idea is what I really like to see come out of this is just more of a push of the consensus yeah. on disease reversal. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is um, if we're not talking to our patients and, and by we, I mean uh, clinicians of all kinds, if clinicians are not talking to their patients about reversal, they are unfair. They are treating their patients unfair. They are taking away the power from their patients. They're taking and away hope. the choice yeah. and hope and all those things. Yeah. And they're central to healthcare. Mm. And so by acknowledging disease reversal is possible, um, discussing the various ways that it can be done with patients, um, which means that physicians and other healthcare providers need to be educated on the choices, yeah. um, and then allowing their patients to choose what is right for them. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a, a huge move forward. Yeah, well, one of the things that we're involved in is uh, creating a patient-led revolution and, and basically teaching diabetics. I, I know what, what got me going in the first, first place was that I had a doctor tell me I was going to lose my toe if I couldn't maintain my glucose. And that, that was the, the – um, there's nobody as motivated in the whole diabetes scenario as the guy who's just about to lose his toe. You know, so, uh, you know, that um, – our goal is to, 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 to start a patient-led revolution, but – our listeners, if they talk to their doctor and their doctor says diabetes is not reversible, we get them to take the Verta papers in for their doctors and ask their opinion. Yeah. And that actually is a, that's a, a, a way to have a conversation, to start a conversation with their doctor. So I want to thank you on behalf of all of our their listeners. You know, I thank am you very much. thrilled to hear that, like thrilled beyond um, belief to hear that because that's exactly what we need to do, right, is we need to uh, – um, because in giving patients a choice, sometimes they just have to be their own advocate. So what yeah. you're doing is allowing patients to become their own advocate and arming them with something to take to their physicians. And in that, we educate yet another physician, right? Um, or another healthcare provider in that, yep. look, yep. here it is. I, I need you to support me in this, right? And I, I think that's fantastic. Oh, well, thank you very much for spending time with me today and for all of the work that you've done. Uh, my listeners are, are going to be uh, ecstatic to have heard you finally on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for having oh. me. It's been great to get to know you uh, yeah. during this week. Hmm. Wow, so happy about Verda's research. You know, Sarah mm. and Dr. Finney are showing the world that low carb is safe and effective as a way to get healthy reverse type 2 diabetes and lose weight. Absolutely. And that reversing diabetes is possible and delicious. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, right? I mean, yeah, everybody exactly. says it's possible. The dudes say, come on, it's, it's delicious. delicious. <laughs> that's what we're all exactly. about. <laughs> but I really think that the consensus that was built around uh, the conference in Zurich mm. about the benefits of eating saturated fat among all approaches to diet and health, these are just momentous occasions like this is a momentous occasion and i think there's going to be a video that is going to be edited of that interaction that we can show yeah. the panel talking yeah. about that right yeah that's my goal yeah so, <laughs> we'll do that yeah. we're going to work on that mm. but in the meantime let's eat it's time for it's time for some recipes, recipes. Outstanding, Carl. So what have you got for us today? Well, as I said, I did the Kitoki fried chicken uh, meet up here, which I pulled off by the skin of my teeth. I mean, I got up at six in the morning and I was cooking all day. Started cooking last night, but it was so awesome. Oh, my God. The chicken was great. Uh, it was just as good as when Emmy, my daughter, and I made it a couple of weeks ago or last week, I think it was. Mm. 
But the real highlight was the the Kitoki fried chicken style coleslaw. Nice. So as I said, I actually went through the drive through of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I got a little side of coleslaw, and I just had a bite. Maybe I had two bites because I had to taste it. I had to know what this was if I was going to recreate it. Right. And I everybody says I nailed it. So here's what mm-hmm. you do. You get an eight ounce bag of chopped coleslaw, which is usually, you know, and sometimes they come with flavor packets, but you just want shredded white cabbage at the very least. Some of them yeah. come with carrots, some with red cabbage. I would actually suggest, because carrots are quite sweet uh, yep. and have quite a lot of sugars in them, I would suggest using bell peppers or capsicum sure, instead. Sure, sure. So start or off, just start don't off with your shredded cabbage or, or just don't have them yet. Yeah, exactly. So you got the cabbage. You need a half mm-hmm. a cup of mayo, a half a cup of heavy cream, quarter of a cup of xylitol or other sweetener. Xylitol worked really, really well. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the thing with xylitol is if you're new to keto and you're a glucose burner and you have xylitol, you're probably going to spend the rest of the afternoon in the bathroom. Ah. You know, that's just going to happen. But if you're, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're in ketosis and you're, you've been in there for a few days, it's not going to bother you. (laughs) Nobody had. When you've been in the bathroom for a few days. No, no, you've been in ketosis (laughs) for a few days. I know what you're trying to do to me. (laughs) Uh, it, it's not going to be a problem if you're in ketosis. So, like I said, there was 20 people at my house tonight. Nobody had a problem, all right? So, was the KFC coleslaw that sweet? Oh, it's really sweet. Wow. That's why I only had a bite the other night. Yeah. But I had to all taste right. it. I had to figure out what it was. So I'm not sure that I'd find that enjoyable anymore. Let me tell you, everybody raved about it here yeah. at the, at the nice. Keto Mini Fest. All right, Mm. so also you're going to have a tablespoon of vinegar, and I bought a bottle of champagne vinegar. Nice. Because I thought that had a nice uh, citrusy flavor. Yeah. And here's the other thing that I tasted in there was a little ground mustard powder. Interesting. I could taste that sort of tang in the back of the throat. You know that, when when I'm talking about? It wasn't like horseradish or something No, it wasn't horseradish, and and it may have just been the cabbage itself, but- but I could mm. taste it, and I know that ground mustard oh, yeah. sort of amplifies that. So, yeah, well, cabbage is a mustard. It's a mustard. Yeah, that's it's right. A mustard that's family. Right. Yeah, that makes mm. perfect sense. So here's what you do. Um, now the bag of coleslaw that I got had the long strands of cabbage in it, so they're maybe an right. inch to two inches long. But right. KFC coleslaw is chopped really fine. Sure. So what I did is I put it in a food processor and I only chopped it with pulses. I only gave it like 12 pulses. So there weren't any big, long pieces left. Don't overfill your food processor when you do that. Yeah, I only put an eight ounce bag in at a time. Nice. Excellent. Good. So then what I did is I put the xylitol and the heavy cream in a Pyrex and put it in the microwave for 30 seconds and then take it out and you stir it. And if it hasn't melted, put it in for another few seconds but you want to nice. s- essentially melt the sweetener into the cream. Mm. And then you just simply combine all the ingredients and you put it right in the fridge and chill it overnight, at least four hours, but preferably overnight. Mm. And it tastes just like, I mean, seriously, there wasn't one person there who <laughs> said, I could not tell the difference between this and KFC coleslaw. That's outstanding, Kyle. The thing that amazed me is when I tasted it was the lack of all those other spices that I thought I needed to put in coleslaw to make it, you know, good. But it turns Mm. out it's just a sweet and a vinegar and a little tang and the mayo and heavy cream, and that's it. Wow. Yeah. That's outstanding. That's it. That's what I got. So what do you got, Richard? So I'm going to uh, talk about a general principle, and this is the one that I got from Sarah Halberg, and this- is when you eat vegetables, eat them with fat. Yeah. Don't uh, don't steam vegetables. Oh. It's a horrible thing to do to vegetables. Why would you do that? Unless you like steamed vegetables, unless you're that one weirdo who likes that. <laughs> you don't like steamed Brussels hey, sprouts. Hey, that's Mr. or Mrs. Weirdo <laughs> to you, sir. <laughs> Have some respect. Yeah, in, <laughs> indeed. So I'm going to talk about a general policy of, of eating vegetables with fat yeah so for example 
one of the recipes we did recently was we were talking about what you do with the fat in the pan mm. after you've made a steak because some of it renders out of the, out of the beef. Mm-hmm. Most people throw that away. Traditionally, you know, in a low-fat world, we throw that fat away. Right. But that's perfectly good tallow. Yeah. And so what I do is I chuck spinach in there. Cup of spinach into a pan with fat from rendered out uh, beef, mm. and now we've got a lovely, unctuous. And I mean, maybe you might need to add a little bit more butter to it, mm. uh, or a little bit of water to it to loosen it uh, to get some more steam happening. Mm. Um, so, that, so that's that's the trick with with spinach. Um, the other thing is, if you like Brussels sprouts, oh. I find Brussels sprouts delicious. A lot, I know a lot of people have the the genetic problem where they just cannot tolerate Brussels sprouts right. in the slightest. And I feel sorry for them, but I like to go to dinner with them because then it's more for me. So, but if it's not Brussels sprouts, it could be asparagus or capsicum, peppers or mushrooms. Be. I mean, there's so many vegetables that you can cook with fat that taste great. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've got two recipes on our blog for Brussels sprouts. One of them is deep fried Brussels sprouts. That's my recipe. Mm. And that's just with a little deep fryer with some dripping in it. And you just pop the Brussels sprouts in. It takes almost no effort to make to make food. Mm. And and they come out with so they're crisp. There's a little bit of the fat coating them, mm. but that that helps essentially curry the vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins from the vegetable into you. Mm. So if you have your vegetable coated with fat, then you're more likely to be able to get your, your fat soluble vitamins like A, E, K and, you know. What's and by one? the way, it's a lot more delicious. <laughs> yeah, and it is a lot more delicious. The other uh, one we have on our blog is Carl's Broiled Brussels Sprouts. Oh, yeah. And that's the other technique. And that's delicious. That with a little bit of bacon over the top. Yep. Mm, so good. Some hazelnuts. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Now, now, now we're actually turning it into dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, my my uh, suggestion for you is to um, add vegetables to your food, low carb, you know, leafy greens, um, anything that's grown that grows above ground, pretty much, except a banana. Mm. <laughs> um, and you 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 just add a little bit of fat. You don't have to add a lot of fat, but the whole idea is to is to coat the food so that uh, so that one of the vitamins are going to come out a lot, a lot easier when it when it hits your absorbing surface of your gut. And the second thing is, it tastes delicious. Yes, a bit of salt it does. Too. A little bit of fat, a little bit of salt. And as we found out from Zurich, uh, saturated fat is not a nutrient of concern. Not at all. And that's that's my recipe. And that's a great show. Uh, thanks to Sarah Hallberg, and thank you, Richard, for getting that interview. You're welcome. Of course, if you have anything you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Instagram at Two Keto Dudes. Make sure to use the hashtag Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.twoketo.com. And you can have a look around the ketogenic forum without needing to create an account by starting with success. And if useless swag is your fancy, like t-shirts, coffee mugs, and all that other junk with witty keto sayings on them, head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the 2 Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our forums and all the podcasts we produce, think about making a monthly pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. And come to KetoFest 2018. We're going to have a party. Go to KetoFest.com. You can also see all of our podcasts and other videos on YouTube at YouTube.Keto.com. And check out my cooking videos at CarlsKetoKitchen.com. And if you haven't already, go leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That's how new people get to know about what we do. And if you know where my voice has gone, please let me know. (laughs) Dudes at 2KetoDudes.com. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. Richard, keep calm, keto on, and fast when you can. Yeah, keep calm, keto on, Carl, and keto fest at least once a year. Yeah. And we'll see you next time on, on Two, Two Keto, keto Dudes. Dudes.